it's uh, okay. Got it. Okay, well, good evening. Thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Clark McDougall. I'm the principal here at Assumption Catholic Secondary School. I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming out to our event. It's an exciting event. It's the first of three of our series uh, of speakers for our mental health workshop. So I want to welcome everyone who's attending in person and for those who are tuning in online to our Parents Reaching Out series on navigating mental health and well-being. Tonight's event was developed by Parents for Parents. It's a collaboration between Assumption, Corpus Christi, and Notre Dame High Schools here in Burlington. Tonight's agenda consists of two parts. For the first half of the evening, uh, Dr. Jackie Robertson and Lauren Sims uh, will help us to learn the facts about mental health in adolescence. And the second half will include our student success team uh, who support your child's mental well-being here during the school day at school. So first of all, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jackie Robertson. Dr. Jackie Robertson is a psychoeducation and practical educator. She's a registered psychotherapist with over 30 years. She's a passionate speaker. She's an educator, facilitator, and a consultant. She has traveled internationally to build partnerships, coach leaders, provide clinical expertise, and facilitate teaching and workshops. Jackie has a wealth of experience in the areas of mental health, uh, family issues, trauma, and adoption, as she provides training for the Adoption Council of Ontario. Her and her husband reside in Durham, where they've raised their four sons. And also joining us tonight is Lauren Sims, and a little bit about Lauren. Her work started out in therapy for kids with autism, and now she is working with youth and adults with mental illness and life changes. Most often works with depression, anxiety disorders, relationship hardships, and trauma. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jackie Robertson. Good to go? Great. So that's a pretty big set there, guys. Right? So to start off, I just want to clarify, I am not a doctor. Um, I'm a registered psychotherapist, so I just want to make sure there's no false advertising here. I gotta find the uh, PowerPoint, don't I? Where did it go? Right. And then I'm on this one. This one down from start. It's not coming in. All right, good to go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come here. Um, like is the introduction, I am quite passionate about uh, sharing information, especially to parents, because um, I'm a firm believer that parents are agents of change. Parents are very important people to their teenagers, even though sometimes teenagers don't make you feel very important. And I often say they don't really make you feel very competent as a parent. So. Thank you for coming, thank you for taking the time. Uh, I also wanna say that some of the things I say because I'm speaking to a general group that some of you, uh, it may not resonate with you or it may upset you, uh, feel free to come and speak to me at the end because that's not my intention because you know, I'm speaking from a general platform so don't know where you're coming from and in terms of what you're struggling with and all that. So um, I'm gonna introduce Lauren as I said, Lauren is, um, just recently, I think we should give her applause. She just recently uh, received her registered psychotherapist designation, and so she was under my coaching. <laughs> I think she's really excited she's done with me now, so there you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about today, we're going to uh, do an overview of mental health and mental illness, uh, diagnosing and mental health professionals, stages of adolescence, impact of COVID, common mental health disorders in adolescents and how to support your youth and teens all in one hour. So as you can appreciate, that's a lot of content, right? 
Uh, sometimes I do one of this for the whole day. So it's pretty general, it's pretty overview. Um, my hope is that it also spurs you to do your own learning and you know, asking people for more information if things are uh, something that you like to know more a little bit. So it's pretty general at this present time, okay? So when we talk about mental health, right? It's a word out there that gets thrown around a little bit or a lot, depending and especially in COVID. But does, what is the overview of mental health? And I think it's important to understand that when we talk about mental health, it is the emotional, the social, and the psychological. It is the interplay of all these uh, pieces and parts of our lives. And what are the factors, and when we talk about these three areas, what are the factors that uh, impact our mental health, right? In terms of when we talk about psychological, um, we often talk about as adverse childhood experiences, okay? And it's just a fancy term. If you really want to research, there's actually um, a study that's been done for many, many, many years, and there's actually a questionnaire that um, you can do, and it's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences. It's called the ACE. Um, to figure out in terms of your life experiences and you know whether you're a child or an adult to just to figure out where it is that in your life experiences that you've experienced are there lots of adverse childhood experiences and the study has shown that when you have a certain amount of childhood experiences um, adverse childhood experiences it's an indicator or a predictor that you may have some struggles later on in your life and it's not just psychological struggles it's sometimes also physical struggles right so in terms of the medical model um, nowadays, there are more and more doctors that actually use this as a tool uh, to screen their patients to see what is it that they need to be aware of that possibly could happen due to adverse childhood experiences. Trauma and abuse and neglect, right? Um, I do a lot of work in my day job uh, as a consultant for Children's Aid. Um, so in my day job, there's a lot of trauma and abuse and neglect that I experience, right? And all those experiences, um, impact you, mold you into some of the things um, that happens and how you behave and how you perceive things and how you read things and how you respond or react to things, right? Uh, those of you who are in the field here, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about because I think every school has a certain percentage of students who have struggled uh, some of this trauma. And then we talk also ooh, about biological um, in terms of long-term substance abuse, genetics, and prenatal exposure. I always say, um, you know, life starts minus nine months, right? We always think winter birthday. Uh, in the work I do, I'm also doing a lot of teaching in terms of prenatal exposure. Um, when a baby is growing and developing, uh, what is the baby experiencing before birth, right? Whether it's substance abuse, substance exposure, domestic violence, right? Do not underestimate. Research has shown that those effects, even though the baby is totally, quote, oblivious, not knowing, it does impact their bio biology and it does impact um, what goes on and how they process things later on. Um, genetics. So genetics is a big thing. Those of you, like, I think the um, announcement is I have four boys, and I will tell you, um, I'm a firm believer that <laughs> genetics is a big thing, and even coming from the same gene pool of my four children, my children have very... Um, specific temperament um, of who they are. And those temperaments do not change. You can shift them a little bit, but they don't change. And they definitely go back to that when kids or adults become stressed or tired or hungry and all that, we go back to our usual temperament, right? So temperament is a big thing when you're working with children, and those of you who have more than one kid will probably agree with me that what works for one child doesn't always work for another child, right? So understanding that genetics play a big role. And then of course the environmental, right? What is happening, nature and nurture. Biology is the nature and environmental is the nurture, right? And the 20, you know, the $2 million debate, which comes first, right? Which influences, and, and, and we believe is of course it's an interplay, right? Biology and environment, you know? Um, a good example is if you have a child who is um, gentler or feels strongly, is feels deeply and also hurts deeply, and they're raised in an environment where you know they're not helped to process some of their struggles, um, it's not the best winning combination, right? Because you have the temperament and then you have the environment that doesn't help them 
process your feelings and process your thoughts, right? So then the child may likely, could possibly then struggle with anxiety later on in life, just because the nature and the nurture, um, you know, are not helping them, right? Um, life transitions, you know, that's a huge part in terms of the environment. I call them seasons of life, right? For this purpose of this talk, I'm gonna talk about adolescence because it's a high school. So we're gonna later on spend a little bit of time talking about the developmental stages of adolescence and what adolescence has to accomplish. There is no pass. Every teenager has to go through it. If you think of your own life, you probably went through it. Some kids go through it at 12, and some kids go through it at 14 or 16 or 18. Some people don't go through it till a little bit later, you know. Uh, but you do have to go through the developmental tasks of adolescence. In red, COVID. One of the reasons why we're here is COVID, right? Like I just, when, even when I say the word COVID, I'm tired. I, I feel it draining for me. You know, I was perfectly fine two seconds ago. And then I see the red and I say COVID. So my mantra in the last few years is, it's, it, everything is COVID's fault. So my car doesn't start, it's, it's COVID. <laughs> I can't lose weight, it's COVID, right? My kids don't behave, it's COVID. I don't like the principal, oh, sorry, it's COVID's fault, <laughs> right? Um, COVID, I, I think one of the reasons why I say we should not underestimate the effects of COVID. Not to minimize, and I'm sure people in here, people have lost friends, family through COVID. So I'm not minimizing the actual impact of COVID, but I don't want to underestimate the I want to say the ripple effect, and sometimes it feels like a tsunami effect of COVID, right? And one of the things that we've struggled a lot with our teenagers is the losses they've experienced, right? Not only our teenagers, all of us, right? There was a tremendous amount of grief and loss in COVID. Lots of things that kids should have experienced, they didn't. A lot of things that we should have, you know, we're looking forward to, we don't. So COVID, the environmental has been a big factor. And even now in 2022, coming to two and a half years, right? There's always that thing, COVID is, you know, I don't know, what, what, whatever the number is now, six or seven is coming up, right? And if you talk to people, I call it COVID has a spectrum of one to 100. And people who view COVID at one should never talk to people who view COVID at 100 because it never goes well. I've seen families who don't talk to each other it's not COVID that's, quote, killing them, but they're not talking to each other because of their views around COVID and the effects of it. So, you know, as we talk about all these things, I just want you to make sure you put that in the back of your brain um, in terms of the effects of COVID. So a little bit of now, this is a little bit of educational piece. Um, when I talk to Trish, I'm like, what do you want me to talk about? Like, it's an hour, there's a lot of things. So a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So the DSM, Diagnostic Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, is now on level five, uh, is now the fifth edition, and I think it was, came out in 2013, thank you, that's why, that's probably one of the test questions, 2013, um, and basically it's a um, book that a bunch of very smart people sit in a room and they have to figure out what are all the different disorders and the criterias, what are the criterias for each disorders. So when you hear all the diagnosis around, whether you hear it with your children or you hear it with whatever, just, just be aware that this is where it's coming from, okay? People, and so, uh, which I think is the next stripe, it, it, it describes what it is, and it's, it's categorized by, by category, by umbrella. So everything under mood disorder will be under one umbrella, everything under anxiety will be under one umbrella, everything about attention will be under one umbrella, and then there's a few diagnoses in each of them. Very specific. You have to meet criteria. It's not just someone picks it. So for a doctor to, to, to give you a diagnosis, you have to meet those criteria. Uh, who can diagnose mental illness? So this is another good thing for everybody to remember. There are only three professions that can diagnose mental illness. You have your psychologist, psychiatrist, and general practitioner or family doctors, or GP. Those are the only three professions in Canada that, that can legally make a diagnosis. I'm gonna say a few things after that though. So psychiatrist is essentially a doctor, a GP, who has decided to um, specialize in mental illness. So you know, you have all the GPs, some goes into cardiology, some goes into internal medicine, and so some goes into psychiatry. Um, the problem with psychiatrists, I don't know about your area, in Durham where I live, 
uh, trying to get a child psychiatrist is like pulling teeth. You guys have the same issue here? Okay. So I worked for 17 years in a psychiatric hospital in Durham for teens. And out of curiosity, I asked Dr. Crystal Lemke, because I think she's a great doctor, so I asked her. She's, I said, what, 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 what is it? Like, why can't we find a child psychiatrist? Well, apparently, in the world of psychiatry, most, most people that go into psychiatry don't really want to work with children because they feel when they work with children, it gets a bit more complicated. They have to work with parents, and then they have to work with school principals. And why would I do, make my life difficult? Because if I work with an adult, it's just you and me. I don't need to talk to anybody else. I give you a diagnosis, I give you a script, and you're off your merry way, right? So psychiatrists can definitely do the, um, the diagnosis. They can also, because they're a GP first, they can obviously prescribe medication, right? And all the medication under mental illness, they're called psychotropic medication. So if you hear that term, that's what it is. So your antidepressants, your, um, help me here, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, all that comes under psychotropic meds, right? Um, most psychiatrists do not do therapy. I don't know whether in your area you have some psychiatrists that do therapy, but most don't. They usually get you in there, got 15 minutes, talk quick, um, and then they might diagnose and prescribe you a medication, okay? Psychologists are not doctors, but they are doctors uh, in the sense they're not medical doctors, okay? Um, and they provide therapy, they do a lot of assessments, um, and they can diagnose, and they can do, some of you, if um, you send your kids, um, they go, you go to them for psychoeducational assessments, right? Which is an amazing tool. Um, I don't know how many your school board um, offers, but um, sometimes it's not enough, <laughs> right? And so some parents have to go privately so they'll find a psychologist. Again, when you find a psychologist to do a psychoed assessment, try to be careful, like you make sure you do your own research, right? You are in the driver's seat, you are the consumer. You know, as a professional, as a registered psychotherapist, I'm always saying, please ask questions, right? Don't take everything we say as perfect truth or gospel truth, because you know your kids best. Now, don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing in my job either, right? So back and forth, have that conversation, right? Because I often say a clinician is only as good as what my clients bring to me, right? And I'm pretty good at what I do, and I can assess pretty quickly, but still, I've always had parents who, I love parents who say, well, I don't know about that one, Jackie. Not quite sure that that one's accurate, right? And you, you have a good clinician, they should be able to tolerate it, right? Because they want what's best for the client, whether it's a child or an adult. So psychologists, there's a lot of assessments. You'll also find um, general practitioners because they're GPs, right? So. Some GPs, I don't know about your area, in, my, in our area, sometimes GPs are very quick to say, I don't want to touch the mental illness part, I'm going to refer you to a psychiatrist, and then it takes forever to get to a psychiatrist, unfortunately, right? But some general practitioners are comfortable in prescribing the anti-anxiety or the anti-depression, much more common mental health issues versus more serious stuff like, you know, psychosis and that. So then they might say, oh, I think I'm going to make a referral to to a psychiatrist. And usually, you need a referral from your GP to get into any um, specialty, whether it's psychiatrist or any other specialty, okay? Um, so, those are the three professions that can diagnose, and I'm gonna go to the other two professions that most of you probably will come into contact with. They are psychotherapists, and they are social workers, right? Um, in Canada, in Ontario, actually, we recently have the Certified Registered Psychotherapy of Ontario, is that what it's called, CRPO? College, there you go, College of Registered Psychotherapy. Um, and they came on about five years, 10 years ago. Sorry, my timeline is really bad when you're at my age. Like, you know, I, 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 I would say things, oh, it was two years ago, and then my kid goes, ah, no, that was five years ago, mom, oh, my bad. Uh, you know, everything your parents say to you, my mom used to say, time flies, and I used to laugh at her, and now I'm not laughing so much. Um, so CRPO came into Ontario about five to ten years ago, and they were a governing body that will uh, qualify therapists to be registered psychotherapists. And they're actually for you guys. They're not really there for us necessarily, but they're for you to protect you so that 
when you go see a RP, a registered psychotherapist, they have gone through the batteries of tests and paperwork and everything else and hours of supervision uh, before they get the designation. So often you may see a registered psychotherapist and also social worker. Um, so psychotherapists provide you know, all the different talk therapy, EMDR, CBT, DBT, narrative therapy, these are all just alphabet soup, I know. Some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Uh, for children, sometimes even for adults, there might be projective therapy and sensory and art therapy and art because children don't always do talk therapy. And I say I'm a strong believer um, that um, my background before I became a registered psychotherapist was a child and youth worker. And those of you who are familiar with child and youth worker, we use the milieu to work with our children. And I'm a firm believer of that. So I do actually will supervise uh, junior therapists or uh, social work, um, child and youth worker to work with children in the milieu as opposed to talk therapy. Um, social workers also uh, can do therapy. They also can do case management. Uh, they can evaluate mental health and implement therapeutic techniques, advocacy services, and they can be psychotherapists. So even though these two professions cannot diagnose, I will tell you, I work for a psychologist and she will always ask me, what's the diagnosis, right? Because I'm the one working with a client, she has to sign off, right? So if you have a really competent psychotherapist or social worker, they may say, these, these are the things I see, these are the traits I see. Um, because we're the ones often working one-to-one -one with the client. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about your preparation for an appointment. Those of you who go for appointments with your child um, or for yourself to get an assessment, right? It is really important. Um, these visits are usually 10 to 15 minutes, right? Very seldom are they long. Uh, it's very challenging for adolescents to advocate for their needs and they may be inaccurate historians, right? I love this when we send a teenager who's struggling with depression and then the doctor asks, how are you feeling? Okay. Oh, are the meds working? I guess so. Okay, we'll just renew the meds. Like, to me, it blows my mind, right? Isn't that crazy making, right? Um, it would be very helpful if you can obtain permission from your child that you come to the appointment with them, right? And if you have permission from your child, most doctors will allow you to come in for part of it at least, right? And if they don't, you might want to have your child kind of advocate or you advocate. And the reason I want you there, based hopefully on the premise that you have a very good relationship with your child, um, is that because you again know your child very, very well. You have been observing him in your house taking those meds for the last two weeks. So you know whether the meds are, well actually, you know, the meds are working because Billy's been up every morning and having a shower and he wasn't having a shower the last, before he was on the meds, right? So I do encourage parents to be part um, of the appointment if your child allows you to be, if your child has to allow, um, and you know, push the uh, doctor to allow you to give, give your impression or your opinions, right? Advocate for your child if they are unable to do so. Make a list of concerns. So sometimes I tell parents, you know, like, make a list, right? Come to your appointments prepared. Write down what are the symptoms you're seeing, right? And stick to the facts. Right? Most doctors or GPs or psychiatrists, they really don't want to know about all your feelings. Right? They just want to know what is it? What are the symptoms? What are you seeing? How often? When is it happening? Those are very, very helpful for psychiatrists to give the right psychotropic meds at the right time. Right? So timing of medication is also very important. You may have the right medication, but if you're not giving the right information, the psychiatrist say, well, give it to him in the morning. And then you give him in the morning and he's falling asleep in class because it's also a sedative. How is that helpful, right? So these information, these facts are very important so that your clinician, whether it's a GP or a psychiatrist, especially for medication, um, have much more accurate picture of what your child is struggling with. Okay, before we go there, because it's a much smaller group, anything that doesn't make sense or needs clarity at all or I'm crazy or... No, okay, that's good, that's good. I like humor, guys, okay? So I can see some of your faces and some of your nonverbals are good and some I'm like, oh, am I in trouble? <laughs> Smile a little more, okay? So developmental stages of adolescence. So I usually start this by saying perfect teenagers in perfect homes with perfect parents in adolescence is a roller coaster. And then I say, there are no perfect teenagers, there are no perfect parents, and there are no perfect homes. 
So expect adolescents to be a little bit tumultuous. Okay, it's a given. So normal, whatever normal is, adolescents will have a roller coaster ride. Now, if your child is struggling with depression, if your child is on the spectrum, if your child is Down syndrome, if your child has FASD, or you know, all these other things here, then adolescents can feel like a tsunami sometimes. Right? It's not just a roller coaster, it feels like a tsunami, right? You need to believe that you are good parents and you're doing the best you can. And sometimes you need to get out of the forest and not take things personally. Because they're not very nice. I know I have some teenagers here. <laughs> sometimes they cannot be very nice. Is that true, guys? Not you guys, because you guys are here. No, 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 not these guys. Because they're the cream of the crop. They're the perfect teenagers, right? No attitude, nothing. But teenagers are very, very difficult. And I, I, I want to stress this because I want you to be kind to yourself. I want you to take care of yourself and I want you to take care and, and be kind to yourself. Because if you're not gracious and kind to yourself and take care of yourself, then it really feels like a tsunami and you're drowning. Right? Who is your village? Who is your community that you're going to? It's not going to be your teenager when he tells you to get out of his room. These ones don't do that, but you know and say a few choice words. Okay, so we're gonna go really quickly. Early adolescence, 10 to 13, puberty, body changes is happening. Um, changes can increase anxiety, more self-conscious of how they are perceived by others. Black and white thinking, right? It's one or the other. And you're going like, if you're a black and white thinker, we live in a very gray world, guys. Have you noticed that? Right? And kids need to learn how to tolerate that gray world. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's your job to help them, right? Um, either right or wrong, no room for the in-between. Um, and they're beginning to explore more independence, want more privacy, and may, may, well, may begin to push boundaries, right? Why not, right? It's 10 o'clock, why not 11? Middle adolescence, again, continued physical changes to the body, um, romantic, romantic relationships begin, and exploration of sexuality, right? So I think I was talking to somebody just now, all the things that are happening in adolescence. <laughs> I'm sure the principals heard it, right? The smoking, the sexting, you know, I'm sure you can come up with your own list so we don't need to go there and I don't want to trigger anybody, right? But adolescents need, to, what are the tasks? What are the tasks that adolescents have to do? They need to figure out who they are. They need to figure out more independence to do things and they need to individuate for me. Spending less time with family, more focus on friends. That is normal. I know you don't want me to hear you say that it is normal. But if you have to do these three tasks, who, I, who am I, right? You're going to start challenging. Well, you know, my mom says this, but I don't think I agree with her. Do I really agree with her? I think that's stupid. I think she's too strict. I think she's too st whatever. Too religious, too this, too that. You know, I don't know what I really believe it. So that's when they start pushing. You know, my mom really wants me to do soccer and I've been doing soccer for 10 years, but I really don't want to do soccer anymore. The soccer is cutting into my family time, right? <laughs> Independence, the push, right? I want to do it myself. I, you know, they often think they're 14 or 15 going on 25, right? And um, individuation. So literally they want to move away a little bit from you to be a person of themselves, right? Uh, they often may feel misunderstood and having a lot of reactive responses. Have you ever noticed that before you can finish the sentence, you get your head taken off, right? You're like, can I, can, I, can I just finish my sentence, please, right? So they're very reactive. They struggle to manage the emotional feelings and their emotions. Emotional regulation is an extremely important, those of us who work in the field, an extremely important skill to learn. Think about it. If you cannot regulate your emotions, you're gonna struggle a lot in life. You're gonna struggle when you break up. You're gonna struggle when you fail your exam. You're gonna struggle when someone says, I don't like your shirt. You're gonna struggle when your dad says no, whatever it is. You're gonna struggle with, because you cannot regulate your emotions, right? It's two, one, or 10. Um, late adolescence, this is more closer to young adulthood. Um, they gain a better sense of impulse control, hopefully for most may be able to assess risk versus reward a little bit better um, and gaining a better sense of self. Now they're beginning to know like, you know, yeah, 
And then he may come back to you and go like, you know, really, mom, actually, actually, this is funny. My son, you know, typical, sorry, and only I can say this, Asian parent, I mean, all my kids do piano lessons, right? Well, that was a bit of a nightmare for me. So at one point I go, okay, this is crazy. I am losing my mind, right? So no more. Nobody needs to take piano lessons because they know my rational is there, music in grade six. So, okay, fine. That's my way of bowing out. My son in grade 10. What do, you think, what do you think he asked me for? Can I take piano lessons again? And now he's my musician, he's my drummer, he plays the piano, right? He had to come to that conclusion because prior to that, it's me on his butt and, you know, didn't fit with adolescence, right? Um, exploring adulthood, creating their own value systems, relationship with parents are reestablished. One thing I want to remind you in adolescence, when your children are pushing you because you're stupid and because you know nothing, apparently I still am stupid sometimes, right? Um, just remember, hang in there. Don't change. Like, you negotiate, learn to negotiate, because adolescence is all about negotiation. But don't give up your values, because they will come back to it. Ooh. They will come back to it at some point, right? I used to joke in my house, did you know that the, that the brain is not fully developed till 25? Did you guys all know that? It's actually research, fun fact, too. Right? So you can actually say that to them, 25. And some of them, I'm not even sure, 25, sorry. I used to argue with my, my kid once because, you know, I, I find that I'm arguing, right? Because they trigger me and they're being stupid and I'm arguing. So one of the, one of the most um, common uh, comic relief in my house, I used to say, Jordan, I'm sorry, I forgot you're not 25 yet. You're still stupid. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have enough of a relationship. He goes, great, mom, thanks. And that was like, I don't want to talk about it anymore because we're going around in circles and I forgot you. He did turn 25, so I can't use that as an excuse now. Now I have to say maybe you're just an exception, right? All right, some of the statistics. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the developmental stages of adulthood. We're going to talk a little bit about the statistics of the impact of COVID. Adolescence is a time of connecting. I believe, yeah, there it is, in red, in red. Humans are wired for connections. Some of us need five, some of us need 100. The introverts and the extroverts. I found my introverts themselves were going crazy after six months of COVID. They loved it the first six months. This is great. I don't need to talk to anybody. I'm in my own house with my book. Right? At six months, they were all going, okay, this is enough of it. Right? They were going crazy. The extroverts were going crazy from the very beginning already. So humans are, are wired for connections, especially in adolescence. Right? Friends are important because that's the arena where they're going to try to learn who are they. Right? So existing mental illness among adolescents may be exacerbated by the pandemic. We know that, right? We cut them out of all the social interactions. Children may experience mental distress during the pandemic due to disruption in routines, loss of social contact, or stress in the household. Solitary substances as opposed to social use has increased. Before the pandemic, most of us parents were struggling with too much use of social media, too much use of gaming and all that. I have not had anybody in the pandemic told me, you know what, my, ki my kids are using less video time. <laughs> and in fact, in some cases, I say, yeah, you might want to let them use some video extra video time because either otherwise you're going to kill them, right? Um, when school was offered, and you might appreciate this, when school was offered to come back or not, I have, um, I work in child welfare with a lot of consultants, and I asked my girlfriend, and I really feel bad for my girlfriends who had kids in the home trying to do their job and they're trying to teach. So I asked my girlfriend who's very close to me, I said, hey Karen, are you gonna send are you gonna send Evan to school? Because it's you know, you have no option. <laughs> and without even batting an eye, without even pausing, she says, Do you want to visit me in jail? <laughs> yeah. If he doesn't go back to school, I will be in jail. So it's hard on adults, it's hard on kids. And again, I do not find many, many, many kids, and this is where the teachers in the room and the principal can say, most kids don't thrive on virtual learning. There is a certain percentage that do. They're probably the ones that are very disciplined. They're the ones that maybe struggle with anxiety. They actually welcome the learning. But most kids don't. Most teenagers don't thrive on virtual. They tolerate it. They limp along, but they don't thrive on it. All right, grief and loss, stress and anxiety, depression. I want to talk about grief and loss because we often think of grief and loss as death, right? But usually 
When we think of grief and loss, we automatically go to grief, death. One of the big impacts of COVID that I found that I feel really strongly for students and teenagers is the grief and loss of so many normative experiences that they were looking forward to. Grade eight grads. Those guys had it double whammy. Grade eight grads didn't get the first year of grade nine that they were looking for. Like when you put yourself in the, their shoes, like that was a pretty crappy experience, right? Right? Grade 12s didn't get their prom or whatever it's called, and some of my, some of my uh, young adults didn't go to university. They said, I can't do this in university. So they took a year off. Some of them were okay. Some of them were kind of languishing, right? And then those who did go to university, they were in their dorm, resident life that they were looking forward to in their room on virtual. So tremendous amount of grief and loss, I think we shouldn't underestimate. And sometimes I think when our children are struggling, uh, I was talking to a parent today, because we feel for their pain and we don't want them to struggle, sometimes we don't stay in their pain with them and we try to move them forward. And I just want you to be very aware that sometimes we just need to stay and be uncomfortable with our children's pain. Don't try to solve it. Don't come up with solutions because it can be very invalidating, it can be very dismissive, and it can also sometimes feel very disrespectful, right? Think about it as adults. Like if I come home from work and I said, you know, I really had a crappy day and I hate my boss. My husband told me, well, he's not such a bad guy, I've met him. You know, maybe you're not being reasonable. If you know my personality, it wouldn't go well, <laughs> right? 20 years ago, really bad. Now I'd be just walking right past him and not talking for the rest of the evening. Because I shared to you my pain, and you, you know, obviously not doing it on purpose. He was just trying to be a nice guy, actually, uh, trying to make me feel better, because he didn't make, I wasn't feeling good. But to me, it's very invalidating, right? Feel my pain. I may be wrong, I may be stupid, I might be overreacting, I might be dramatic, I might be drama queen, all that stuff. I don't need to hear it now. What I need to hear from now is like, wow, sounds like you had a really bad day. Do you want me to start dinner or do you want me to take a cup, a cup of tea? Maybe three hours later we can unpack it. But in the moment, the empathy piece. So for our children, I think it's really important, you know, as they go through COVID and the, and the losses they've experienced, that we learn to empathize with them and stay with them, right? There's no solution to it anyway. All right. So I talked to Trish, and we thought we would cover quickly. What time is it? Oh, there you go. Ooh, ooh. Eight o'clock, right? Yeah, eight. Okay, sorry. I'm going to go quickly. So we're going to talk very quickly. I'm going to talk less in terms of mental health, some of the more common mental health disorders uh, that you guys might be familiar with, right? So the stats of mental illness in youth, quickly. Um, critical period. Uh, most living with a mental illness see their symptoms eight, begin before age 18. So sometimes you see the symptoms and they may not be diagnosed till later on, right? But most people will say, yeah, I saw some of the symptoms when they were younger. 20% of Canadian youth are affected by mental illness or disorder. 39% of Ontario high school students indicate a moderate to serious level of psychological distress. Symptoms of anxiety and depression are one of the most common ones, right? A further 17% indicate a serious level of psychological distress. So 39 says, you know, moderate, and then 17 are expressing pretty serious stuff, right? Young people aged 15 to 24 are more likely to experience mental illness and or substance abuse use disorders than any other age group. One of the highest suicide rate is young adulthood. And old people, depression rate, right? And why is it? Because a lot of our young adults, when they're leaving, they're often leaving a home and going to an institution like university or college and living in their home. All of a sudden, the expectations are increased, academic expectations, and the resources go down, the support goes down. They open the fridge, oh shoot, there's no milk. At home, there's always milk, right? They wanna talk to somebody, they can come and jump in your bed. University, it's two in the morning, I'm having a meltdown, I can't call my mom because she's sleeping and I don't wanna wake her up. Okay, so when we talk about the DSM, remember I said in the DSM there's um, umbrellas. So in the, D in the DSM, there'll be major affective disorder. Affective is just another big word. It starts with an A, A-F-F-E-C, P-I-V-E, moods, feelings. So under the major affective disorders are some of these depressive disorder, okay? Most of you are very familiar with clinical depression. The word decided, dysthymia, is depression, I call it a lower grade. 
Okay, so I wish I had a flip chart. But if we do, if you and I do live like this without depression, right? People who do live with clinical depression do live like this. And then people with dysthymia does it in between. So they're not as clinically depressed, but they're not where normal is kind of thing, right? Seasonal affective disorder comes with the seasons. You guys know that, winter. Everybody in North America should definitely do vitamin D at the very minimum. Um, persistent bipolar is two poles. Uh, depression and manic, right? Um, psychotic depression, that means depression with psychotic is just another fancy term for out of touch with reality, okay? So they're depressed and they have psychotic features. Uh, postpartum, those kinds, I don't think we need to talk about. Um, again, one of the things with teenagers, um, I don't know, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm like, no, depressed, right? So one of the things is educating your teenagers, right? You know, they're depressed versus I'm feeling blah. I'm struggling. I'm not having a good day. And maybe, you know, I'm having an exam and I know I'm going to fail because I didn't study for it, right? There has to be criteria to actually use the word major depression, okay? So some of, some of this you can educate your children because I find sometimes in teenage years, it's a little bit of everybody is depressed kind of thing, right? Um, it has to be five or more symptoms in the DSM for two weeks or more. So again, these are more like diagnosis. And some of the additional symptoms that come with it is fatigue, feelings of worthlessness, sad, guilt, dread, inability to concentrate, eating habits, you know, um, sometimes there's thoughts of death and suicidal ideation, uh, weight loss could be a weight gain, too much sleep or not enough sleep, agitation and irritability. So for teenagers, not, they, they don't do depression Teenagers and kids don't always necessarily do depression as adults do depression. So they can come in and come out of it. So they can go to school and they're okay, and then they come home and they look really depressed. So there is a bit of a difference in that. And boys and girls also do depression a little bit different. Um, girls may talk about it and show it to you. Boys may be involved in more high-risk behavior, right? So sometimes they get misdiagnosed. Does this work? All right. This is her. Be kind to her. I'm not going to go down because I won't get up. Keep talking. So for generalized anxiety disorder, this can be seen in terms of maybe your own health, someone else's health, relationships, romantic relationships, familial relationships. And specifically with adolescents, a lot in terms of grades, friendships, everything on the side of that line. A really, a really common one as well is bullying. Um, and that is characterized by obsessive thoughts and compulsive behavior. Um, and so common ones Like we are perceiving some, there we go, our mics. Um, perceiving some sort of a threat, um, a perceived threat, sensing danger. Um, common, I guess the most common symptom with that is the shortness of breath, feeling like you can't breathe, and that can mimic something like a heart attack, and so it can be very overwhelming and very scary for especially adolescents who don't have the tools to be able to cope and manage when that is happening. Um, with panic attacks especially, some of the reasons that that could be happening is if an adolescent is struggling with emotional regulation. Another big one is, is change, life transitions, and really a big one that we're talking about today is COVID-19. 
Another one is just managing with high levels of stress, especially I know with a lot of grade 12s that I work with right now, they are very overwhelmed and stressed about getting certain grades to get into the universities that they want to. And so that's been quite common for, for quite a few of them. Um, as well as social anxiety, just being fearful of, of talking to others, public speaking, um, dating, just really coming into to new conversations. And so for adolescents who were experiencing anxiety before the pandemic, now coming back, learning in person, can you imagine how scary that would have been? <laughs> Especially for a lot of, let's say grade nines, who are learning and, and really wanting to make new connections and weren't able to. So then to come from two years of learning online to then come back in person and have to put yourself out there is, is really overwhelming um, and, and can be very challenging for, for a lot of them. Um, other ones appear as just agoraphobia, separation anxiety disorder, more commonly found in um, infants and, and babies. Okay, so the most common one we see in adolescents is just generalized anxiety disorder. And like I said, that's characterized by excessive worry. Um, and in terms of the DSM, so again, what we hear most often and most commonly is a lot of people throwing around, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. Um, it, it, it's not that actually, <laughs> but, and this is part of what we do in therapy is actually a lot of psychoeducation, especially when it comes to adolescents. Is it actually anxiety or is it something else? Because if it's anxiety, we can work with that, but if it's something else, we can also work with that. Um, I, I had an interesting story where I had a 13 year old come to me and said, Lauren, I'm, I'm depressed. And I was like, okay, let's, let's talk about it. Um, what makes you feel like you know, you're experiencing some depressive symptoms? She said, I did a random survey online and at the end of it, it said, you're depressed. So, but but this, is, this is what they're taking and this is what they're using. And she said, you know, I did the test with other kids in my class. So this is what we're working with and we're trying to reteach and re-educate what it actually means to be depressed um, so that they have accurate information and that they are not harming themselves and scaring themselves when they are reading this because her parents didn't know she was dealing with this on her own and when we did a bit of education, she no longer had to come into session because it turns out she wasn't depressed. Um, she's, 13. she's 13, yeah, grade nine. So again, um, with anxiety, the most, the most important thing to note is that when worry and fear starts to impact our daily functioning, that's when it becomes an issue. Um, all of us in this room experience anxiety, whether we know it or whether we don't. Anxiety, a little bit of anxiety can actually be helpful. That gives us that extra push, that extra motivation to be self-motivated. A lot of us have been working from home. It's been tough on some days to stay motivated and do all these other things that we're doing. So anxiety can actually be helpful, but when it's impacting our just day-to-day -day doing just the basic tasks and we're unable to do it, that's when it becomes challenging. And so again, the worry is out of proportion with reality. Um, we are worrying about things outside of our control. Anxiety makes us think that we can control everything in our lives, have a hand in every single situation. That's absolutely not the case. And so we're doing a lot of reframing in therapy as well. Um, and of course it, it impacts our competence and our performance. Good job. Yes. <laughs> to do it sorry guys all right we're gonna cop very quickly this is not so fun topic non-suicidal self-injury versus suicidal behavior so this is something i hear a lot in adolescents right self-harming behaviors and parents of course like any good parents we freaked out when the thought of our children are harming themselves or the thought that they might be suicidal so they may appear very similar one of the things i need to really be aware is that self-harming behavior and suicidal behavior has different intent right People who self-harm, which is not just only in teenagers. My husband does a lot of therapy with men, and he tells me, surprisingly, I learned, he goes, men self-harm too, that he's been hearing. It's just that it's not as obvious as the teenagers that we see. The common ones that we see with teenagers is, of course, cutting, right? I think if I was to ask you what is the most common, you probably would see that. Uh, cutting or self-injured behavior, the, 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 the science behind it is that people who self-harm is to release psychological distress. It's not because I want to die, it's because I'm feeling crappy, because 
I just broke up with my boyfriend and I don't know how to regulate my emotions. Somebody send a posting, which I'm sure you guys do all the time, and my whole world, and back again to emotional regulation. So the only thing I know in my toolbox is to self-harm because it feels good. And, and this is where you're gonna, you know, like you guys need to hear, self-harming behavior is very addictive. And actually the science behind it, it actually does release a chemical that makes you feel a little better at first. Okay, so that is why once you start it, sometimes if it's a true self-harming, you know, and again, not all of it is a true self-harming, they may continue. And having said that, I'm gonna say, people who self-harm don't usually want to die, they don't usually die, but they may because like any addictive behavior, the first, I'll, the first beer does this. this. Then if you do one after a while, the first beer doesn't do it anymore. Same thing with self-harming. So sometimes people who self-harm may harm themselves really seriously because it just goes more serious and more deeper and more, you know, catastrophe. But the intent at the beginning is uh, to release the psychological pain. Whereas people who have suicidal behavior, at that point, they may actually want to die, okay? Um, I'm gonna go real quick because we don't have much time. Um, I think we talked about this. Um, okay, comorbidity. One of the things you're gonna hear about comorbidity is co means coming together, morbidity means illnesses. So what are some of the comorbidity that happen at the same time? Mood disorders and anxiety disorders happen pretty often, right? Mood disorders and eating disorders happen pretty often. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Again, a good clinician needs to assess that because I need to know if it's coming from depression that's leading to anxiety. Then I wanna deal with the depression and then the anxiety will go down, right? Is someone highly anxious because they're not going to school and now they're getting depressed because they know they're gonna fail and not get to grade 12, then I need to deal with anxiety first. It's really important to deal with what is, the, what is underneath sometimes the iceberg that's you know, making this iceberg going very scarily, right? Um, the other thing too is substance use, which I'm sure in high school, it's not such an uncommon thing. Sometimes our teenagers are also using substance to self-medicate. And like self-injurious behavior, it works. So don't tell your kids, don't cut, and don't self don't use drugs unless you can give them an alternative too, right? I really don't want you to cut, sweetheart, because of blah, 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 blah. So let's figure out a plan. What can you do when you feel crappy? Right, so we need to find out what is it. We need to teach the kid what's going on in their body so they know it's coming up and what alternative tools they have in their toolbox instead of reaching for the razor blade or the wheat or the pot or whatever else, okay? So substance abuse is a big thing with our teenagers and because they're often, some of them are self-medicating. All right, this is the best part. So can I go five minutes more? Is that okay? All right. How to support, I hate being late. How to support your teens and adolescents. So all that is a theory, blah, 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 blah. You can research it, you can know. The part that I'm really passionate about, the best part, is your role. Started with it, and I wanna end it with it, right? Pace. This is under Dr. Daniel Hughes, um, and he came up with this, and it's usually great for kids in trauma, but I feel that this is a great thing to do with our children. Pace, playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy, right? Sometimes, just be playful. Things are really, really bad, and you know, this, the, 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 the roof is falling off, you're pissed off at them. You know, you might not want to say, you know what, let's just, go to, let's just go to Dairy Queen and just get a blizzard. I just can't deal with this right now, let's just go to Dairy Queen and get a blizzard, right? You know, we're just gonna put this aside and we're just gonna watch a movie because we're going around in circles and things are not going well. Acceptance is what I said. Accepting where your child is, right? Don't try to move them because sometimes we wanna move them because we can't tolerate the yuckiness that they're going through, right? Acceptance is a very powerful thing. Curiosity, tell me more. I really, really wanna know. I can see your distress, right? And I don't understand it. You're right, I don't understand. Can you please tell me more about it? Help me understand, you know? And empathy, 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 empathy. If you use these four things, whether you're a parent or a school official or wherever, a police officer or whatever you're doing, I guarantee you, you have a higher chance of de-escalating anything. Right? Someone comes in and they're really, really pissed off at me and I go like, yeah, sounds like you had a really bad day. I'm sorry. It's really hard for them to get mad at you because you just agree with them, right? Uh, so those are the four things. And remember the developmental stage that they're in, identity, independence, and individuation, right? And home is where they can feel safe to practice this. 
Home is where they can feel safe, but home is also where you get to be the punching bag sometimes. You know those bobo dolls that you hit, they go down and they come back up? I have that one in my playroom, right? And sometimes you feel like a bobo doll, right? Because you keep coming back because you're a good parent, right? And it does feel that way because they have to do these three tasks and you're the safe person. All right, so I click this? Nope. I go down to escape. I don't know whether you guys have seen this. This is not about the mail. Okay, I want you to pay attention. Yeah, I want you to pay attention to this man's face. It is so powerful, so silly, but so powerful. And I think you'll get across what I'm trying to say to all of you. Anybody seen this before? Love it. Watch his face. Oh, wait, what happened? You didn't pay for it? Oh, skip it. Is the volume going to come on? Volume? Sorry. Sorry. That is not my skill. What? Write it down. Empathy. Oh, no, this one, is, it's not about the nail. It's on YouTube. It's not about the nail. It's only two minutes. Watch it, and then you can even send me your emails and tell me how it makes you laugh. Basically, it's a very, very amazing uh, YouTube to, to explain to you how important it is to, to stay on empathy, and that it's not about the nail. Okay, I'm going to move on to this. Sorry, guys. Can, you can probably, yeah, I'm probably giving it away already. That's not it. Okay. Okay. Light show. Yeah. Ah! No? Power of connection. Connection before correction, right? Very, very important in adolescence. Your connection, your relationship with your child is extremely important before you start correcting them. What, where is your emotional bank account with your child? Is it pretty healthy? Because if it's in the depletion and if it's really in the, in the red, it's really, really hard to tolerate the correction, right? But if it's pretty healthy, then your teenagers are more likely to tolerate the correction because you know it's taking a dollar off, but there's 50 bucks in the account, right? I use the bank account as an analogy. Um, sensitive, but present, right? Reassurance, routines, and regulation. Acknowledge their perspective and clarify. Assist in problem solving, be an active support system. Get them. There are the teenage years, this is not the time where you tell them what to do because it doesn't really work well. Remember, they're supposed to individuate independent identity. All right, so what do you think? You know, sometimes when there's a consequence, especially my, in my time, I say, you know, I gotta think about it. That usually freaks them out even longer. You gotta think about it, because they don't know what it is, right? Or you ask them, well, so what do you think the consequence should be? And oftentimes, I find that teenagers actually give you a more uh, harsher consequence than you do when you give, ask them to do it. And now they had to kind of follow through with it because they came up with the consequence, right? I can't really argue with you. Ruptures and repairs. This is a big part. Right? There will always be ruptures. It's called life. It's called relationship. How well do you do repairs? Right? Do you connect after you do the correction? Right? And I, this is the part where I don't know whether some of you will agree with me. I say it is always the responsibility of the adult to repair the relationship. Right? And it doesn't mean you have to do it immediately because you might want to punch them in the face at that time, so don't. But when you go to bed or the next morning, say, you know, buddy, 
still love you, still my son, will always be, and the porch light's always on for you, okay? Um, increase your sense of responsibility and independence. Have them be a part of a conversation about the non-negotiables, boundaries, and limitations. This is another one I want to ask. Do not expect them to thank you for your good parenting. <laughs> you laugh, you laugh, you laugh. I've had so many parents go, well, they're mad at me. I'm like, did you thank your parents when you limit, they limit set you and you, they grounded you? Well, no. So why are you expecting them to thank you for your good parenting? They will not thank you for your good parenting until they have their own children. Okay, so expect them to be upset with you. Uh, allow them to make mistakes. This is the playground where they're gonna make mistakes in high school, right? Make as many mistakes because you're gonna be there to help them process it, right? Because remember, they're gonna leave your nest pretty soon. You want them to have those skills. Uh, think outside, this, outside of the box, alternative solutions. Create an environment that allows for honesty to discuss issues you're experiencing. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Back to connections before correction, right? If, if, if you want to ask me what is the one thing you can do as good parents, create a safe relationship. Create a safe relationship because your children need you to journey with them. Think about your own lives. Why is your life easier or better when you're going through crappy stuff? It's because you usually have someone going it through with you. It doesn't take away whatever the death you've gone through or job loss, but because someone's there with you, you know they can do it. Resiliency, which is the thing we want to build in our children, is built in healthy, consistent, reliable, safe relationships. Ah, communication. How many of you think you're active listener? How many of you think you're a good listener? No, I'm not. No, no, no. Two. Okay. Really? No, I'm not saying you're not. If you are really an active listener, it involves your five senses. And if you're a really good active listener, there should be a pause after the other person talks because that's when you formulate your rebuttal. Most of us are very bad active listeners, right? When my husband's talking, I'm really coming up with like, that's stupid. <laughs> Don't you laugh because you guys know that, right? Because I'm not really listening to him. I'm waiting to come up with a rebuttal. That's not active listening. Active listening involves your five senses and communication is over 80% nonverbal. How you stand, how you do, your tone, your eye contact. Please be aware of that, okay? I love you with your hands this way and probably not very convincing. Don't get caught with power struggle. How many of you get into a power struggle? Nobody wins in power struggle. What do you have control over, what don't you? And the reality is your teenagers, close your ears, already know you don't have control over much. Right? When they hit teenagers, they already know like, yeah, what are they gonna do? Lock the door? Right? So again, relationship, what do you have control over, and, and don't get into power struggles. Emotional regulation, coping stress, coping strategies for parents, listening to the emotions, being attuned to the behavior, tuning into your child, um, staying calm. I think there's another video to be shown later on. Okay, toolbox. These are some of the toolbox. I think you have the PowerPoint so you can show some of this to parents who want it. These are some of the toolbox that you can suggest for your children to use when they're getting dysregulated, okay? Instead, because if you only have a hammer in your toolbox, you will always use a hammer. Try thinking using a hammer, I don't know, to screw something. What does it look like? Pretty bad, right? So you wanna make sure your children develop many toolbox, many tools in their toolbox. Um, okay, so this is another video that you can watch. It's called Flipping the Lid. It's by Dr. Dan Siegel. Again, just a few seconds, a few minutes in YouTube. And one of the things he talks a lot about is we all flip our lid, guys. When you flip your lid, children flip their lids, right? So when your kids are flipping their lids, when they're offline and they cannot think clearly and they're reacting, you need to make sure you're not flipping your lid. I often say when two, when two lizards fight, it's not pretty. Somebody loses his tail, somebody dies, right? And you're the adult, so you need to step back, right? And, and instead of getting into the power struggles. These are some of the resources that Lauren has kind of investigated in your community, but I'm sure your social worker has a whole butt lot more. Okay, and some of our personal information. Sorry, hate being late, sorry, 10 minutes. Nice job. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Jackie. Thank you, Lauren. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, as I'm sure as a lot of our parents were sitting through this, I was thinking a lot of the same things. Uh, first of all, you know, when you talked about differences in our support systems, the differences between a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a GP, your psychotherapist, a social worker, I thought it, it was fantastic. It was e you broke it down well. It was a lot easier for us to understand uh, the differences in our communities. Uh, I love the part about uh, when you go in uh, for a consult um, to ask your child for permission to, to be in there. I think that's a huge part. A lot of people don't understand in education, when our students turn 18, we, we automatically cut the parents out by law. We, we can't converse anymore with the parents unless we have permission or they have permission from their son or daughter. So I think that's key, being a part of the conversation with your kids as we go through different consults. The stages of adolescence were great. Uh, understanding your kids. Uh, Jackie, eight years too late for me. Okay, I got a 22-year-old boy, a 21-year-old boy, and an 18-year-old girl who's really seven years older than she is. I could have had this a lot earlier, to be honest. <laughs> well, unfortunately, my boys are bigger than I am now, so it really doesn't work. Um, understanding kids, I thought was great. Uh, when I taught um, philosophy, I used to put a quote on the board uh, on the very first day of school, and it was from Mark Twain. And it said, at age 16, I thought my father was a huge ignoramus. And at age 21, I was surprised at how much the old man learned in five years. <laughs> and inevitably, the students would come in, they, they would ask, I wouldn't answer anything about the quote. And sure enough, a week later, somebody put up their hand, I get it. I get it. We know everything, right? Um, parents uh, need kids to return, you know because the kids are driving them crazy at home. I think the best thing this year was on the very first day of school, I like to stand out front and welcome the kids you know, back into school. I had one grade 11 boy saddle up next to me and he said, sir, I don't know if you have uh, any power over this or not, but please, for God's sakes, do not close the school again. I cannot be at home with my parents anymore. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. Kids dealing with, uh, you know, learning systems, society in general. You know, you look what's happening in our world. We have the, the war in Ukraine. We, we have different things happening with different social groups. You look at politics and what happened, you know, in the past election with the states and so forth. And then COVID, of course. And then us. We're, we're changing our learning platforms here in the building. They're at home. They're learning online. They're back in school. But they have so many restrictions. You can go here. You can't go here. You've got to be masked when you're here. You know, it, and then you're back home again. You're back online. And it's not only tough on our kids, it's tough on our teachers. We ask our teachers all the time to change their mode of delivery on how they deliver, how they connect with kids. It's not easy on kids. It's not easy on staff. We've all coped together. I think your presentation was great in helping us break that down on what people are going through. So thank you. Lauren, I love your piece on anxiety disorders. We deal with it in the school every single day. And uh, it's, it's true, you know, especially when it comes to social groups. Our kids just getting back in the building was huge for us. Um, I, I, I always laugh uh, at when we started opening up programming outside of the classroom. Uh, one of our teachers, uh, Ms. Ponikvar, she came running up to me and she was so excited. She goes, you'll never believe this. Our curling team has 45 kids signed up. Every year we would beg to get four just to make a team. We had 45 kids sign up for our curling team. I thought that was fantastic. And how do you support your team at the end, Jackie? I thought that was great. So thank you. I really appreciate you being here. I think this has been a great start for our pe uh, parents reaching out series. Um, thank you. Um, thank you to all being here. Thank you for everybody who's online as well. Uh, it's something new that we tried. We had some technical difficulties, we always do, but it's great to iron them out, get this out, because I think the three talks are very, very important, not only you know, for us as staff, but for our parent community when we co-parent kids together. So thank you for being here. Uh, for those who are online, uh, be sure to tune in next week. Brett Allman will be presenting at Notre Dame on Thursday, May 5th. If you are interested in attending in person and you have not done so yet, please check the Notre Dame website and click on the link where you can sign up to be a part of our audience. Remember, those who are attending in person have an opportunity to win a $1,000 iPad. So this is going to end our live stream. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, once again, if we can just have a hand for our two presenters, Jackie and Lauren.
Thank you. For those people in our audience, we're going to take one minute. If you care to get a refreshment, please help yourself. The washrooms are on the right, and then we'll start with our panel of speakers up here. Thank you.